Thank you so much and good evening. It is an absolute joy to be with each and every one of you. And, uh, uh, and first, Linda, bless you. Bless you and thank you. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for the vision. Thank you for just the integrity that you bring to this work. I, um, I, um, I cannot be more thankful for each and every one of you. I love this organization. I love this organization. I love what you stand for. I love what you do because in essence, what you do every single day is you make sure that every single Marylander is seen and that every single Marylander's journey is understood and supported. Because one of the challenges I've always felt about how we think about mental health is a, it's a, uh, you know, oftentimes it's the, it's the unseen casualty. It's the thing that people oftentimes don't see or recognize. It's the thing that we can be walking past someone on the street every single day or interacting with somebody and it just looks like they're not hurting. It just looks, it just looks like they're okay. But it's understanding that how can we create a society that's actually full of both compassion and upliftment. A society in an atmosphere where people understand that all of us are going through and that all of us deserve a chance to be seen and uplifted. That's exactly what you all provide. And that's what your leadership means. And I'd say from the bottom of my heart, thank you, thank you, thank you for all you continue to do for all of us. I'm also incredibly excited to, uh, to congratulate the two honorees today, two people who I'm, uh, who I'm dearly, who are not just dear friends. And so, Senator Kelly, bless you and thank you so much for all you are. And I, I, I remember, um, you know, it's true, when, when Senator Kelly first, when I first got word that she was going to en endorse our campaign, um, it was really early. I, we were polling at 1% when she first said she's going to endorse. <laughs> so I got worried. I was like, listen, Senator Kelly wants to endorse your campaign. I was like, is she sure? <laughs> but she was kind enough. And we sat on, we sat on, her, uh, we sat on her couch. And before we recorded the video, she said, let's just talk. And we talked about the issues that matter. She talked about the why now and what is the urgency and the things we wanted to get done. Um, I have to tell you, Senator, it was not just a game changer in our campaign. It was a game changer in my life. And I'm incredibly grateful and thankful and excited to see you honored here today. So bless you and thank you. And to my delegate, my chair, I, um, you know, when, when, you know, first running for governor, you, you run with the hope that, you know, you get a chance to run and you have, you know, you'll have friends as, as, as colleagues. And it just so happened that the year that I was, you know, running for governor was the year that, uh, that Delegate McIntosh decided to retire. And I was like, I w hope it wasn't something that I did or I said. <laughs> um, there is nobody who deserves this more than you. And there is nobody whose fingerprints are all over the beautiful state that we are and the beautiful future that we have. Uh, more than you. I am grateful. I will be your forever constituent. I will be your forever constituent and your forever friend. So bless you and thank you. And, uh, and, 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 I, and I do have to uh, give a shout out to my, uh, to my partner in this work, Aruna Miller. I, um, it, is, it is true. And, and, and listen, if you thought the committee cheered, no one cheered harder than I did when she said yes. And, and one of the beautiful things is that not only throughout this entire process have I found uh, a dear and a cherished friend, someone who I respect and admire with everything in me. I also think about the conversations that the Lieutenant Governor and I, by the way, I love calling her the Lieutenant Governor. It makes me so, so happy that Aruna Miller is Maryland's Lieutenant Governor. I adore her. And, and, I, and I think about it because um, 
you know, we have these conversations. I remember early we were having conversations about, you know, what do you want to be the items that you want to specifically focus on? Because I was very clear throughout this entire journey, you are my partner in this work, period. But were there specific things that you wanted to, you know, really drill in on, that you wanted to own? And, you know, I said, you know, listen, you're a transportation engineer by training. So I'm assuming it'd be something with transportation and some of the work that around infrastructure and building that we're going to be doing. And you know, the first things that she said when I asked her that question, mental health. Mental health. We have a person who is going to end up being the most consequential lieutenant governor in this country, and you can mark my words on that, and a person who takes mental health seriously. And I'm so excited to be your partner in this work today. I'm blessed. And you know, we, 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 we started on this journey with, a, with an idea and really a, a one government philosophy, and I'm, and I'm so excited to see uh, so many of our, so many of our, our teammates and, and cabinet members. Uh, Secretary Beatty, it's wonderful, wonderful to see you and bless you. Uh, Secretary Keller, it is great to see you. Uh, and and uh, I'm going to talk about you and your, and your new focus in a, in, in a second. Um, uh, I know we saw Secretary, Secretary Woods here uh, as well who's standing right there in the, in the, in the back, and, and you're going to be hearing our Secretary of Veterans Affairs, and you'll be hearing soon uh, from Secretary Scott, who I've not yet, yet seen the word. Uh, in the insurance commissioner as well, absolutely, yes, and one, and, but you know, but this is really important, no, but this is really important because when we think about this issue, this issue, and the issue of addressing mental health, it is not a lane, it is a lens, right? It is not something that we are going to think about throughout a specific prism. It's about how we are going to think as, a, as an administration as a whole about how are we addressing a larger paradigm. That when we first started this campaign, we first started this journey, we talked about this idea, well, how this is about economic growth for all Marylanders, right? This is about economic competitiveness, making sure that we are going to create pathways for all Marylanders for work, wages, and wealth, right? We talked about that and we campaigned down that for two years, but here's the reality. You are not going to have pathways to work, wages, and wealth if you are also not focused on health. Because if you're not focused on health, none of those things are going to be real. Not one. And our ability to focus on wealth, our ability to focus on, uh, focus on health, our ability to focus on mental health is a core and a crucial criteria. It is not a lane, it is a lens. And you will see that we've placed a very aggressive focus on it when it comes to the proposed budget that we have laid out, that we are focused on making Maryland a healthier state. And that with that, we are going to prioritize mental health in the way that we are putting together not just our budget allocation, but how we are planning on using the pulpit, how we are planning on using the platform. And, and, and truthfully, and, and you know, newsflash for anyone who's been paying attention, we do things a little bit differently in our administration. <laughs> we like to move at a different pace. People say, you guys are moving pretty fast. Our answer is get used to it. <laughs> That's how we function and it'll be okay. <laughs> and it'll be okay because we're going to think about things a little bit differently. Because oftentimes in our society, we like to think that the way we deal with and the way that we treat mental health is that it's a problem that needs to be institutionalized. We must relegate to the past and move past this idea that the treatment of mental illness and mental health is being done by prisons, and the way that we are going to deal with it is by criminalizing it. We are going to relegate to the past this idea that we have our largest mental health providers in this country and in our state is our prison system. We have traveled this state we have visited organizations and institutions that promote access to mental health resources. Where just the other day, the Lieutenant Governor uh, and I had a chance to visit with Secretary Scott. We visited the behavioral health systems in Baltimore. 
which is a group that's dedicated to supporting young people in the Baltimore area by providing excellent care and resources for those who are struggling with behavioral health. In these travels, I've seen firsthand how completely inadequate, completely inadequate, access, affordability is to mental health and how it continues to hold our state back. And as governor, one of my imperatives in order for Maryland to thrive, in order for us to do what it is that we need to do, in order for Maryland, for this to be Maryland's decade, we have to unlock the potential of everybody in our state and we must do a better job of supporting youth and all Marylanders as they navigate mental health and substance use challenges. And so if you look at our proposed budget, that's exactly what we proposed. A record $1.4 billion in direct state support for mental health and substance use programs. Which, by the way, if you look at just the investment that we made within substance use disorders, it represents a 39% increase from last year's budget. And also elevating the issue, and I'm very, very glad that she is here right now, the, uh, the uh, I, I used to be mayor, former mayor of Hagerstown, former extraordinary mayor of Hagerstown, who is now our special secretary with a focus on opioids, Secretary Emily Keller. <laughs> She's going to get this done right, y'all. She's going to get this done right. That our budget, our proposed budget, includes and allocates $5.5 million towards 988 and the mental health crisis intervention number. And I want to be very clear. We are going to make sure, as long as I am governor, we are going to fully fund 988 and make sure that we have that as a platform for all of our citizens to be able to benefit from. As a demonstration of our commitment, even before the inauguration, even before all the festivities, even before we were sworn in, we showed that we were serious about it and how we are going to move away from this idea of this criminalization of mental health and behavioral health because we asked Steve Thomas, I know someone who many of you in this room know, who runs Anne Arundel County's crisis intervention team to serve as the co-chair of our public safety committee during the transition. Let me explain what, that, what I just said, that we have someone who focuses on crisis intervention serving as a co-chair of public safety. <laughs> that we allocated, and we, our proposed budget allocates, because I say proposed because I see all, with all the legislators in here, it is wonderful to be your new colleague. <laughs> We are so excited to be your partners in this work, and I'm looking at Senator Gazzoni as, as, as a great example, head of, head of, uh, head of Finance Committee. Um, uh, and we're going to need their support in order to get this passed. So to all the members of the legislature, hello. <laughs> it's so great to work with all of you. But in our proposed budget, we allocated more than $616 million to fund provider rate increases in the fields of behavioral health, developmental disabilities, <laughs> Medicaid, and other services. And more than $154 million to expand dental coverage to Medicaid clients and $17 million to reduce wait lists and programs that allow seniors to age in place in their communities. In other words, we ain't playing. And we want to put real resources behind this. Because at a time when we know that it is not going to be words enough to be able to address this, it must mean deeds, it must mean budget, and it must mean that this state is going to lead. And Maryland on this issue, it will lead. <laughs> this is going to be a, pro a priority for us because we understand that in order way, only, only, only way that we can get this done and get it done right is if we make it a priority. We're going to work to ensure that the programs in place now that they can show real results. 
and get the supports we need, like the mental health first aid training that was used in Anne Arundel County beginning in 2015, and being able to take a look at programs that we know that are working and ensure that they have what they need in order to scale. The mental health first aid training program first introduced participant, part, participants to risk factors and warning signs of mental health problems, builds an understanding of their impact, and overviews appropriate supports. The eight-hour training that is given to every single officer greatly contributed to the 21% reduction in the use of force. 21%. Those, in those incidences have not only remained low inside the county, I want to let everybody know in the county I am paying attention, the lieutenant governor is paying attention, and now our intention is to make sure that we can scale this out and we watch those same results that are taking place all over the state of Maryland that Maryland will lead. The important thing about this is that this is a platform and a program that does not say what we are going to do to law enforcement officers. It says what we can get done with them. Because the people who are helping to take the lead on the initiative are our law enforcement officers. Who by the way, who by the way when we're talking about mental health supports, we also need to focus on things like what are we doing to help the helpers? That's why when we talk about mental health supports, it's not just about how do we introduce mental health supports for our students, it's also about how we're introducing mental health supports for, the, for our educators and our teachers as well. It means that not only, not only are we going to introduce mental health supports for the people in our communities, but how are we introducing mental health supports for our law enforcement officers and our other first responders whose job it is to support the people in the communities as, hell, as, as well. We must make sure that we are actually helping the helpers inside of this process of mental health supports. And the idea that creating healthier communities does mean that this is going to be hard work, that this is going to be challenging, that it's going to take investments. It's going to take investments in not just people, but it's also going to take investments in facilities. And no longer will we allow these facilities of support to fall into disrepair or allow Marylanders that are struggling not to get the help that they deserve because of a lack of capacity that this becomes our chance. This becomes our chance both in budget and in legislation to be able to create a framework that all Marylanders, regardless of their past or their path, can be seen and heard. And I know I do stand here um, as someone who's been the core beneficiary of that. I stand here as someone whose family have been core beneficiaries of your support and your advocacy and your love. Because one of the earliest memories I have in my life was watching my father die because he didn't get the health care that he needed. One of the earliest memories I have of my life was watching my mother struggle because here she was, an immigrant to this country who now had three children that she was going to raise on her own. A woman who, whose husband, when he was sent to the hospital, was, com was complaining about his throat. And when he went to the hospital to tell the doctors that something was wrong, he was met with skepticism. And the question that they asked my mother when she went to the hospital to go check on her husband was, is your husband prone to exaggeration? that he was sent home with painkillers and told to get some rest and if it got worse to come back without realizing that the painkillers was actually continuing to numb the problem. And hours after he was sent home, he died in front of us. I watched how my mother struggled. I watched how my mother unexpectedly and instantaneously then became a widow with three children that she was gonna be raised on her own. 
I watched how the supports that she was able to receive and the help that she was able to receive came in the eyes and the hands of her parents, my grandparents. Who, when she called and said she needed help, they gave her the answer she was hoping they would give, which is bring the kids here and we can help. The thing that I think most about inside of this moment is I am so blessed and so thankful that my mother could find her refuge. I was so blessed and so thankful that my mother could find that willing ear on the other end of the phone. But when she said, I need help, they said, we can help and come up here. And that's what made us move from Maryland up to New York and up to the Bronx to live with my grandparents. And I think every day about the people who might not have that. I think every day about the people who, when they make a phone call, might not get the same level of support. The people who, no fault, who to no fault of their own in their most difficult and in their most challenging moment when they're just simply looking for acceptance and simply looking to be seen find themselves invisible. And the consequence that that will then have on each and every one of us. In order for our state to do what our state needs to do, we need you all to win. In order for our state to do what our state needs to do, we need for you all to be able to do your work. In order for our state to do what our state needs to do, we need for the issues that you are advocating for to be lifted up, to have resources put behind them, and to know that you are going to have champions on every floor of the State House and champions throughout every corner of this state. I could not be more thankful to be your governor. Because I know every day you're fighting for people like my mom. I know every day you're fighting for people like my grandparents. I know every day you're fighting for people like me. And I'm here to tell you that as long as we are here and as long as we are in these seats, you're going to have us as partners fighting right alongside with you. We are grateful for you. We are thankful for you. These next days are going to be incredibly important. And at the end of session, we're going to have some stuff to celebrate. Job well done, you all. Thank you so much. <laughs>